Hello, my name is Joseph Monkhouse. I'm delighted that the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution has invited me to put together a video regarding a recent project of mine, recreating the natural sounds of the Somerset Levels 2,000 years ago. This video is divided into five sections. I'll begin by briefly talking about my background, followed by my inspiration behind these projects. I'll then provide some historic context on the Somerset Levels during the Iron Age and discuss the process of researching and creating the soundscape. I'll end the video with some brief comments on the future of wetland ecosystems in Britain. I have attempted to bring this talk alive with natural sounds, some recorded by myself during my travels, and others from professional sound recordists. In short, I'm a birdsong fanatic, who is usually immersed in some natural history-themed venture. I hold an MSc in bird conservation, and currently work as an ecologist in the renewable energy sector. In my early 20s, I spent four summers in Indonesia, researching the avifauna of southeast Sulawesi, largely in Wallasey and lowland rainforests. I contributed to several scientific papers, and led the first comprehensive account of the birds of Manui, a remote and poorly studied island. Here's one of my recordings of the dawn chorus there. I have a particular interest in birdsong, and this has been a running theme through most of my endeavours. I tend to identify birds by sound rather than sight, and prefer to record audio rather than take photos. Naturally, my MSc project was focused on bioacoustics, more specifically acoustic adaptation, investigating whether coots have evolved to use the surface of water to broadcast their calls. Alongside ecology work and other natural history projects, I like to put together bird song themed videos for the YouTube channel Birdkind, which I started with my friend Jack, a fellow wildlife enthusiast and bird watcher. Initially, the videos comprised simple compilations of bird sounds, such as the nocturnal voices of British birds, but more recently the productions have become slightly more involved and conservation orientated, focused on creating historic soundscapes. Combining my ornithological experience with a basic grasp of sound production picked up from a pastime of music composition, I felt I could try recreating the sounds of lost ecosystems. These soundscapes would be based on evidence, both observational and archaeological, with the aim to transport the listener into an immersive environment, whilst highlighting biodiversity loss in an auditory way. I wanted to convey a contrast between the past and the present, to perhaps reset the baseline of what people consider to be the biological norm of the British countryside, certainly with regards to diversity and density of species. It's difficult to comprehend the gradual degradation of our environment when it occurs over a lifetime, and even harder to imagine what it was like before we were born. Some may argue that the loss has been continuous ever since the Neolithic migrants began clearing the Mesolithic forests to make way for agriculture. The classic line, I remember when this was all trees, is all too poignant now. In 2019, the RSPB's conservation focus was on the dramatic decline in farmland birds. It felt appropriate to highlight this by reconstructing the sounds of a hay meadow set just over a century ago. This was before the great intensification of agriculture, where farms still served as rich and variable habitats, maintained by more traditional methods of farming. The meadowscape was based on evidence extracted from six dusty volumes of British birds and their nests and eggs by Arthur G. Butler, 1898, where I learnt that birds such as soul buntings and red-back shrikes were commonplace in the south of England during that time. Now either one would attract a swarm of twitchers. Incredibly, the book also featured the great orc, though it did claim it was probably extinct by that point. The Meadowscape had a very positive reception. I didn't anticipate something quite as niche to appeal to so many people, and it was uplifting to find that others shared my longing for ecological time travel. Aside from the pure enjoyment of making it, the feedback gave me further incentive to continue with the theme of historic soundscapes and try out a different habitat in a different era of British history. I settled with 2,000 years ago, deep within the lost wild wetlands of the West Country, My plan to travel back two millennia was inspired by a recent interest in British prehistory. This was ignited by discovering that my local patch for birdwatching, a short walk from my residence, is in fact an Iron Age hill fort. 
The undulating multivallet ramparts have remained impressively deep and very discernible within the now mature oak and beech woodland that covers it. 2,000 years ago it would have been open country, overlooking the two key rivers in the area, the Pang to the north and the Kennet to the south. The Iron Age people left behind an enduring mark on our landscape, their great monuments still prevailing in the 3,000 plus hill forts etched into our hills and plateaus. Yet with virtually no written documentation, the age remains charmingly enigmatic, I wanted to experience it. While operational, the open country of my local hill fort of Grimsby Castle would have supported many species found in the hay meadows of 1900. Thus I decided that a wetland habitat would allow me to experiment with different sounds and include some charismatic creatures that are now absent from our countryside. The most extensive wetland assemblage of species from the Iron Age has been unearthed from the Somerset levels in two lake villages, Glastonbury and Mere. These excavations allowed me to draw from real evidence to provide a partially accurate soundscape. Furthermore, the Somerset Levels is often regarded as an ideal location for future rewilding projects, most notably imagined in Benedict MacDonald's recent book, Rebirding, where he postulates a very idyllic future Britain if we embrace rewilding as a nation. The animal remains were found amongst the vestiges of prehistoric suppers, that had endured two millennia preserved in the ground. Glastonbury Lake Village, the larger of the two, comprised up to 20 roundhouses at its peak, with a wooden stone causeway and palisade stakes bordering the settlement. The villagers' diet was varied, partially consisting of wild and domesticated species. Evidence of lead sinkers for nets and baked clay slingshots indicated how the wild animals were caught. Living on the wetlands meant that agricultural farming was limited, However, a substantial amount of barley, beans and peas were present too, grown on drier land and perhaps obtained by trading fish or wildfowl. Bones of coastal bird species such as puffin, cormorant and manx shearwater also suggested some contact with the coast. The residents likely traded furs of beaver and otter with neighbouring communities, using canoes to travel through the open water channels. The entire levels would have covered approximately 160,000 acres, a vast mosaic of shallow open water, wet alder and willow woodland, reed swamp and sedge fen. It wasn't until the Middle Ages that significant changes to the landscape occurred. Rivers were diverted, large swathes of wetland were drained and livestock was grazed in pastureland. I find the historical elements fascinating as it helps place myself in the landscape, though my focus for this project was on the natural sounds. The History of British Birds by Derek Yaldon served as my primary reference material. The book presents a timeline of birds in Britain, starting in the Cretaceous and ending in the present day, drawing evidence from paleontological and archaeological excavations. The book provided a comprehensive list of all positively identified species recovered from the Somerset Lake Villages. With such a substantial catalogue of species, I had the ability to choose what time of year to set the soundscape. I considered early winter, with immense migratory flocks of wildfowl arriving from Scandinavia. But I settled for early spring instead, a more vibrant, melodic chorus, punctuated by bugling cranes and booming bitterns. There is something quite archaic about a bittern's territorial call, a cross between a bellowing warhorn and a large drum, sparking a range of charming regional names for the bird. Bumble, Butterbump, Bog Drum, Maya Drumble, Bog Bumper, Bull of the Bog, the list goes on. Most of the bird remains recovered in the excavations comprise medium to large sized species, though a plausible natural soundscape requires all layers of the biological orchestra, from sea eagles to sedge warblers. Songbirds were largely absent from the sites, their skeletons are too fine and fragile, and seldom survive long in the peat. Fortunately, evidence of their archetypal predators, marsh harrier, Montague's harrier and sparrowhawk were discovered thus alluding to the occurrence of small passerines. I represented these anonymous songsters with those that frequent modern-day wetlands, foremost in Britain but also in mainland Europe, being careful not to include our most recent arrivals, such as the Chetty's warbler, as their range expansion is driven, in part, by climate change. When imagining the density and diversity of sound, I drew from my past experiences of the primary rainforest of Sulawesi, where the resident calls of white-bellied imperial pigeons are accompanied by cascades of eerie black-headed kingfisher whistles that ripple across the forest. It's such a unique composition of sounds to that part of the world, especially as a large proportion of the species are endemic to Sulawesi. 
At the time, the forests were an unblemished ecosystem, vast and void of human life. This was evident in the dawn chorus, a continuous chain reaction of calls only limited by audible range. The familiar crow of a distant village cockerel briefly pulled me back to civilization, until I realized it was actually a red jungle fowl, the wild descendant of the domestic chicken, and I was rapidly pushed back into the wilderness again. Far closer to home, I was inspired by two recent trips to Poland's primeval forest, Bioverge. Several species I observed there also lived in Somerset levels during the Iron Age. The old growth forest, interspersed with clearings and wetland habitats, supports a surprising assortment of species living in close proximity and sharing one acoustic domain. This medley of habitats is less evident in Britain, where species are typically restricted to habitat islands, many of which are human constructed. Yellowhammers, for example, are primarily farmland birds in Britain, often restricted to hedgerows that border arable crops. In Bioverge, you can see them in a presumed natural state, appearing unexpectedly in clearings deep in the forest, living on patches of scrub and singing alongside wood warblers and red starts. The Somerset levels, although predominantly wetland, would have supported a similar amalgam of habitats, and I am sure that this was reflected in the soundscape. We're fortunate that a vast and comprehensive archive of the world's bird sounds are available for download on zenacanto.org, uploaded by sound recordists across the globe. To ensure the sounds blend convincingly into the soundscape, the audio tracks must be largely free of background noise, especially anthropogenic sounds. Distant motorways or airplane flyovers are most often present. Once I had obtained the sounds, I required a visual backdrop. Southwest Heritage Trust kindly granted me permission to use their digital model of Glastonbury Lake Village. In addition to providing a visual accompaniment to the soundtrack, it allowed me to synchronise the audio tracks to a moving template. The inclusion of settlements in the CGI recreation provided an opportunity to subtly weave human sounds into the background ambience, denoting their presence in the wetlands, whilst implying minimal dominion over it. I won't go into too much detail about the technical side of creating the video, I should retain some mystery to the method, but to give you a rough idea of how it was put together, it's useful to know about panning and layering. First of all, panning allows you to control the position of a sound source from the left ear to the right, and helps to create the sense that the sound is coming from all directions. Most importantly for this, it allows you to synchronise each sound to a visual display. Panning introduces a multi-dimensional element to the soundscape, but to truly convey space and depth, the sounds must be carefully and repeatedly layered at varying volumes. European temperate wetlands in spring are almost always accompanied by a relentless chattering chorus of warblers. To create this warbler backing track, I constructed a separate soundscape composed of all these species. I then placed the warbler chorus in both the left and the right headphone with a panning control and set each audio track to low volumes to give the impression that the sound continued beyond hearing range. The final production comprised 44 species spread over 73 recordings, blended into a six-minute audio track. Roughly two-thirds were species validated by Iron Age remains, including several iconic birds, Dalmatian pelican, common crane, western osprey and white-tailed eagle. It was thrilling to interlace these four evocative creatures into one acoustic environment, each call a unique depiction of wilderness. Although the Somerset Levels has experienced significant environmental changes in the past 2,000 years, it has remained an important area for wildlife into the present day, and a prime destination for wildlife enthusiasts, often drawn in by impressive starling murmurations that occur in mid-winter. Steps to improve and expand the wetlands are ongoing. A recent not-for-profit initiative, spearheaded by Somerset Wildlands, is focused on acquiring areas of farmland to create a large network of rewilded habitat islands throughout the Levels. It is likely that the project will be enhanced by the reintroduction of the European beaver. By felling trees and building dams, beavers are the natural architects of riparian habitats, and a nationwide reintroduction program is proving their effectiveness and not only enhancing wetland habitats for wildlife, but also reducing soil erosion and decreasing flood damage downstream. This combination of rewilding, reintroductions and setting aside more land for wildlife may help to re-establish the original soundtrack of the Somerset Levels, and hopefully make my artificial soundscape into a reality. I certainly plan to make more soundscapes in the future. 
I'm eagerly awaiting spring to obtain footage of an old-growth woodland. This will be the backdrop for a Mesolithic arboreal soundscape. I would also like to fast forward 50 years into the future, to an idyllic naturalised cityscape, with skylarks rising up from skyscrapers and goshawks swooping through Parkland. In a moment, I'll play the soundscape in its entirety. If you would like to hear more and are interested in keeping up to date with my project, please follow me on Twitter at Joseph Monkhouse and subscribe to the YouTube channel Birdkind. To avoid distracting from the audio and to help create an immersive experience, I've decided to keep the video free from narration and annotations. Anyone curious about the bird sounds featured can find a timestamp species list in the video description below. Thank you for listening.
Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you enjoyed the uh, that last little uh, trip through the the uh, the wetlands of two thousand years ago. It was very, uh, as I say, very meditative, and um, I'm sure some of you are better birders than me will have clocked, clocked up quite a few uh, spots, uh, bird spots. So um, feel free to unmute yourselves if you have uh, questions, and we Joe is available to talk about. Um, the project and any other questions you may have. And, and Joe, I'll, I'll get things started actually by just saying, what, when you put that together, um, what, which were the hardest, were there were any of those sounds the, the hardest to sort of source, both in terms of their authenticity and in terms of actually getting hold of what, of the sounds themselves? Um, first of all, thank you all for tuning in. Um, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I can't, off the top of my head, I can't remember any particular species that are difficult to source, but there were a few where there may be maybe two or three recordings, which often were dominated by maybe a motorway in the background or an airplane flying over or something like that. So there was, for some of them, there was a bit of editing work involved. I had to kind of bring down the background noise or maybe cut out a few bits. Um, yeah, I mean, especially in this day and age, it's very difficult to find sound recordings that don't have human sounds in them, um, especially in the UK. Uh, it's almost impossible, actually, to find any sound recordings in the UK that hasn't got any form of ant anthropogenic sound. So I think probably 99% of the sounds in that video were sourced in mainland Europe, um, mainly in Poland, actually. And what proportion of, I mean, obviously, I think you said in the, the video that some birds were, were clearly much more common then. Were, are there any birds that featured in that video that are now no, no longer present on the British Isles? Yeah, um, Dalmatian pelican is one. Um, White-tailed eagle, only because it's been reintroduced, is now back. Uh, obviously, there was a population in Mull, but in terms of Eng South England, um, yeah, Dalmatian pelican, white-tailed eagle. Cranes is another one which has also been reintroduced, but apart from the reintroductions, yeah, it's the big ones, really. Sort of the iconic <laughs> wilderness species. Yeah, and then and then also there have been, as you say, there are other birds that would have been just much more present than they are. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what small birds were there. I mean, there definitely would have been, you know, that was the right habitat, and there's, there's a huge demographic of species that isn't represented in the fossil remains or the archaeological remains. So I had to make up for that. Otherwise, it, the sound would have sounded off. There would have been a, a gap in it. So I needed to fill that in. Um, and yeah, I, I just used the species that we, we, we hear today, really, to fill that gap. 
Okay. Has anyone else, anyone got any questions for Joe or anything about the uh, um, the, the video? We've got a question from Matt. Matt says, uh, "Hi, Joseph. I love it. Do you know of any UK soundscape rewilding projects or studies?" And that, that's from Matt. Um, yes, I mean NEP is the big one. NEP Estate in Sussex, which I visited once. Um, unfortunate visit. Uh, and between lockdowns last year, I visited it. NEP is the one that springs to mind. I know that there's a couple in Scotland that are going on. Uh, in terms of wetland re, um, restorations, I mentioned about the Somerset wildlands thing that's going on. Um, I don't know if they've actually got that off the ground yet, but they're certainly planning on it. And I think there's also one in um, Suffolk and Norfolk potentially as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's sort of, I suppose in the last five years, five or 10 years, it's kind of come into the spotlight, this rewilding this new way of doing conservation work really because in the past it was you know cordoning off an area and protecting it and just sort of leaving it static it's, you know it's sort of stasis really but the more we've understood about um, ecology we've worked out that it is it's a di you know it's dynamic ecosystems and they've got to be engineered by these these often large large mammals um, kind of reinvigorated by turning over the soil or cutting back doing the things that anyone would do if they're maintaining their garden really um and it's changeable you know it starts like like net for example at the moment it's scrub but eventually it will develop into mature broadleaf woodland over time and they're, they're aware of that and that might be to the detriment of some of the species they've got there at the moment such as the turtle dove um once it develops into a mature broadleaf woodland they'll have to move on somewhere else um but yeah i think it's it's certainly the way forward for conservation work um and it's something yeah i'm fascinated by <laughs> um question from ian gilchrist on a topical note, uh, has the last 12 months of much reduced traffic brought a noticeable improvement for hearing uh, wildlife background sounds? Absolutely. Um, oh, it was amazing. Uh, the, the first few weeks of lockdown, especially, um, I started doing nocturnal migration recording. Um, I live in Berkshire and I had a, my microphone pointed to the skies every night and um, picked up the common scoter migration movement flying over Britain. So that's a that's a sea duck that we barely ever see. Um, it's right, usually winters right offshore of the UK. Um, and uh, in about April, but actually about this time now, they are, they're moving back to Scandinavia. Um, and they, are, they fly over our heads in the middle of the night and nobody has a clue. But when, you know, when, when the traffic stopped, you could pick up the sound of these ducks flying over at night. And there are hundreds of thousands of them flying over. And actually lots of colleagues of mine were doing the same and we could pick up where they were flying across. And I think from, from where I'm positioned, it was probably flocks that were wintering off the Gower coast that were flying over Berkshire. So it's, yeah, it's, it's been um, really interesting to see the, the changes in sound or certainly hear the clarity of sound since, the, um, since lockdown. That's fascinating. So are those ducks that wouldn't normally sort of put down in, in in Britain, or they just fl literally fly over on their way to somewhere else. Yes, well, they they they, they put down, but they're far out at sea. So yeah. you, if you the only time you would see them is from the cliffs or something, and you'd see a, yeah. a black oil slick out at sea, and that'd be a big flock of them. But apart from that, and apart from the odd one that might got ground in a, re a lake or a reservoir, um, yeah, you don't really see them in the mainland. What, what noise did they make as they flew over then? It's actually in, in. I put it in. I put it in a video. Uh, it's. I'm not going to do an impression of it, but it's sort of. A, <laughs> it's like a little tweeting sound as they fly over. Very subtle, but it's a uh, yeah, really nice sound. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, question from Francoise. Uh, Hi, Joe. Amazing video. Is there anywhere left in the UK to visit and experience something like your video? Um, I mean, you're still going to get a lot of the sounds in some in the sunset levels today, bar some of the more iconic species. Um, I mean, I'd say if you want to get something as dense in terms of the sound density, you want to go to mainland Europe. Uh, you want to go to places like the Danube Delta, places in Poland and Belarus. That's where you've kind of got really the last wild bastions of that kind of habitat. Um, but yeah, you still get impressive soundscapes in Norfolk, um, Somerset and, and Suffolk as well. Um, and, and places in Wales too. But yeah, it's not, it's not quite the same as it used to be. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And uh, so it's from Dick Bateman. Dick, uh, perhaps being modest, says, I recognise the cuckoo. I'm sure you recognise some others, Dick. Uh, what was your favourite bird call on the video? Uh, marsh warbler. 
so that was the one that sounded really wacky. So I think it's in the second part, second half of the soundscape and it's sort of singing in a bush and it's uh, one of the best mimics in the world. It uh, sort of rivals the lyrebird in terms of mimicry. And in that particular recording I used, it had the sound of a nightjar in there, which I thought was really quite cool, which is a bird you would not associate at all with wetlands, but somehow it's picked it up. And what, what I find really interesting about marsh, marsh warblers is that they actually, they migrate to Africa um, in the winter and they pick up the sounds of African birds and incorporate it into their song when they come back here. So you've got this weird mix of, you know, strange African bee eaters and then blackbirds and robins and stuff all in the same, all in the same song. So yeah, that's definitely my favourite one to play. So, so you had, uh, you had a, a marsh harrier impersonating a nightjar. Marsh, they're called marsh warblers. Sorry. Marsh warblers, sorry, but, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dick is urging you to. He's saying, "Go on, mimic them." He wants you to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you touched briefly in the video on on a plan or an idea, whether it's an idea or something you've started working on of um, imagining a sort of a city soundscape fifty years in the future, which I thought was really interesting because it does feel as if there is a. Um, you know, I think people are appreciating and the, the whole lockdown of coronavirus has helped people appreciate the potential for rewilding in the cities. And, you know, do you think that's something that's realistic? Is it, doing this, if you did a similar project for that, would, would that be a sort of a way of sort of helping to campaign for that? What, what are the changes that we need to make to, to allow a, a much more diverse wildlife back into our cities? I'm not sure the exact ways of being able to encourage them into cities. Um, I mean, apart from the obvious, like green roofs, um, making areas more pedestrianised, um, putting up swift boxes and house martin boxes, um, incorporating them into the design of the buildings, that kind of thing. And being a bit more diverse with the plants that they, you know, people put in their gardens or that they put on the streets, having native species is a, would be a, a really good way of doing that. I mean, I think I, I, I'd like to do it because I want kind of a more of an optimistic note as well. I mean, all these past soundscapes, are, they're really good fun, but they've got a really kind of depressing undertone to them as well. And I, I feel that doing one maybe set in the future might give people a bit of incentive to try and kind of get to that point. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I haven't got any plans of doing it immediately, but I would like to do it at some point. It would be, it would be a cool cityscape sound. Yeah. And you mentioned something to me about... Um you'd be interested in trying to recreate the sounds of birds that are now extinct. Um, how, how would you go about doing that? And what well, sort of birds actually, did you have in mind? <laughs> um, probably the, the most well-known ones, um, like the great orc, passenger pigeon, um, Carolina parakeet, uh, Labrador duck, potentially. Basically ones where we haven't got sound recordings of them still existing, but have written documentation of their sounds that I can use as, as a, sort of a baseline really um i actually did sample it during the, the talk video when when it flashed to the the great orc in the book that i was reading um i i fiddled around with slowing down the sound of a razor bill which is one of its close extant relatives that you see on the coast here um because they uh, the description of their sound was almost a sort of slowed down razor bill so i thought i'd try that out and um yeah I, it would be <laughs> a bit of fun really but you know i'll give it a go and see what happens fantastic and any any final questions before we wrap up from anyone's anyone got a last thought or a uh, it's almost like I feel with Joe, we could almost ask for requests. Like, can you do, you know, could you do the sort of the Scottish Highlands in the? I, I'm in always the up to do requests. Um, yeah, I am. <laughs> Gary, Gary, I think you need to. If you unmute yourself, um, then you can by all means go ahead. No, I was just wondering about um, uh, more raptors. I, um, the you, you mentioned the, the marsh harrier, but um, I didn't hear a lot of raptors in in there, like buzzards or anything like that. Maybe I made them a bit too subtle. There were quite a few. So there was an osprey that flew over okay. um, at the beginning. Um, I, I sort of did the sound of it hitting the water and then it flew over. Um, I had a Montague's Harrier in there. And at the end, there was a, a white-tailed eagle chasing a duck as it flew over. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe I was a bit too subtle with the, the raptors. Um, but they're not the... <laughs> they're not often not the most vocal of species <laughs> no, i was just listening for that keening sound that you know you get from peregrines and and um, yeah 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 that pro i probably should have put a peregrine actually yeah, yeah they, they do frequent wetlands quite a lot 
Uh, yes, and it's a sound we're familiar with around here in Bath as well, because uh, as you, I think, as you know, there's a we have a nesting uh, pair in I think the Church of Saint John the Evangelist and the, the live cam as well. Um, thank you for that, uh, Gary. Any any other questions? I also thought maybe, as I say, if any other, if anyone else has wants to show off with any birds they spotted in there, but. Um, uh, and it's a message from Judith who says, thank you, Joe. That was fascinating. We love the Somerset levels and we will look anew at them. Um, in fact, I, you know, I, I haven't lived in this part of the world for that long. I, did, I have been managed to get down to see the, the starlings uh, down there, which is obviously an incredible sight. When is the best time to, to see them? Is it, It's coming up fairly soon, isn't it? Oh, the starling migration, I'm afraid we've passed it. Oh, it's, is um... it in the autumn? It's midwinter is the best time, no, um, about February. They, they build up throughout right. the winter. Um, it, in fact, the video that I had on there was one that I took. And although the, the, the actual murmurations that occur in the evening are obviously the, the kind of spectacular ones that people go and visit. But what I would recommend people doing is going there about five o'clock in the morning and getting them coming out of the reed beds. And that is the most one of the most spectacular things I've ever experienced because they, they start to kind of, you hear the rumbling sound of them coming up. And then you get this black tar sort of oh, draped all over the reeds. And then, and then they lift off. And the sound around you is, is, is amazing. It sounds like a kind of Eurofighter typhoon flying over. So I would recommend doing that. With that sound you had on the video of the, the starlings, was that actual sound or was that, that, was that sound engineer magic? Applied? That was, I, was, I adapted the, the, the original sound recording because it was a bit fuzzy in the original video. But yeah, that was... Uh, that was Starlings. <laughs> so that was a good reflection of how it would sound. Oh, yeah. There. Oh, yeah. 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 Amazing. Um, and Judy's deciding that November, December is good too for murmurations at Avalon about 4 p.m. Um, we've got a few months to wait for that, but uh, it's incredible. Um, and Dick, Dick says, did we hear villagers singing? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, good spot. That was, because um, I, I love music. I wanted to put some kind of, some. I w originally was going to put a flute in there but I thought I'd actually have a chap singing. And I found a video of a guy singing Manx, which is, you know, one of the old languages of Britain. And I thought um, I'd, I'd put it just, just sort of subtle enough that you can, can hear it, but not that you can make out any words. And it kind of, I thought it fitted with it. So I put it in. <laughs> well, well, Dick Bateman is one of our musical performers, so he may maybe he'll incorporate some Manx Iron Age singing into his... Yeah, apparently it's a traditional Manx song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go, Dick. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, um, unless there's any last questions, I, I'd just like to say thank you to Joe for, A, I think it was clear, should be clear to everyone from watching that video how much work went into that six-minute um, uh, uh, soundscape. It's just absolutely wonderful. Um, and the dedication and the, and the attention to detail to do that was, was amazing, Joe. So I really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed your explanation of why you did it and how you did it as well. And I also really enjoyed um, everyone's questions tonight. So I think we should give a round of virtual applause for Joe. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure having you and hopefully we'll have you back for some other um, project in the future, Joe. I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, and thank you for everyone who, who came tonight. And I, I do hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, as you, as most of you will know, the video will go up on the YouTube channel in about four weeks time. And you can finally find out all the birds that were featured and put you out of your misery. Um, fantastic. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a lovely evening and enjoy the rest of the weekend. And I hope to see you uh, at another Brilty event soon. Good night, all.